good evening ladies and gentlemen fellow speakers and our moderator professor panse i would like to thank yogesh bhai and the gujarat plastic surgery association for this opportunity to participate in this webinar yogesh bhai is my guru and has had a huge impact on my growth and training as a surgeon i would not be where i am today without his guidance and constant encouragement over the years starting with vitrag bhai myself sharad ashutosh and bijoy and everybody else that followed us at the plastic surgery department at ssg hospital baroda we owe our training and standing as plastic surgeons to yogesh bhai thank you sir this is a picture with our team from ssg hospital baroda in 2002 seated are dr milind mehta yogesh bhai and vitraksha standard standing are ashutosh sharad myself and bijoy we miss you bijoy on the left is yogesh bhai with the founder of our department professor sn sharma only yogesh bhai has gotten younger with the years i will be talking about an approach to mangle limb and we'll discuss three patients with different presentations however the theme uniting all of them is outlined here the most important steps are to start with the end in mind during the initial assessment and debrimo you must be able to envision what the future looks like based on that you may make a plan and follow through with the plan along the way some changes may occur but it is your ability to see the future and plan accordingly that will decide the outcome it is very therefore very important for the senior or experienced surgeon to be there at the time of the initial assessment and debrimo the other key steps for a successful outcome are stable skeletal fixation and staged reconstruction my first patient is a 16 year old malaysian boy he was a junior national basketball player and sustained a mangled injury to his right forearm when it got caught in a proning machine at his father's prawn farm a proning machine is used to deshell prawns and looks like this and runs by an electric motor someone accidentally started the machine while he was checking it before the day's work he was seen about 10 hours after the injury clinical examination and radiographs showed loss of the proximal two third of the radius and the proximal radio ulna joint with a segmental fracture of the mid shaft of the radius he had loss of the biceps and pronator teres insertions although the muscles themselves were intact in addition he had loss of the common extensa origin mobile ward and the posterior interosseous nerve resulting in no extensa function he also had loss of the proximal flexor pollicis longus and anterior interosseous nerve resulting in no function of the flexor digitorum profundus of the index and middle finger lastly he had loss of the radial artery immediately after the brachial artery bifurcation let us start with the end in mind what i want for the bone and joint is a stable forearm axis although the elbow wrist and hand are structurally intact loss of the radius and proximal radio ulna joint makes the wrist and diuj unstable as the load is transmitted from the hand to the distal radius via the diuj and this is a soft tissue linkage that will not be able to take the load our plan was therefore to convert it into a one bone forearm by fusion of the diuj although this will prevent any pronosupination he could still rotate his forearm at the shoulder as far as the musculo tendinous units are concerned what i want is good finger and wrist extension and to restore thumb index and middle finger flexion i have a fu functioning biceps pronator teres wrist flexors and the fds my plan was to insert the biceps into the brachialis that inserts into the ulna and do a standard set of tendon transfers for radial nerve palsy namely a pt to ecrb fcr to edc and pl to epl for the flexor recon we plan to use the fds tendons we use the fds ring finger for the fpl and the fds to fdp transfers for the index and middle finger overall this plan would get us good extensor and flexor function although the grip strength would be weaker the perfusion and the sensation of the hand were intact so no vascular or nerve procedures were required the divided proximal end of the radial artery could be used to power a free flap and a flow through flap could improve perfusion of the hand although this is not necessary last is the plan for skin cover the aim was to provide a good cover for the tendon transfers we plan to do a flow through alt flap we decided to raise it along with the vastus lateralis muscle in order to make the flap harvest faster and ensure adequate perfusion of the large skin island also a free flap would allow early mobilization of the tendon transfers when planning for the end it is important to remember that the focus should be directed towards restoring function and not anatomy sometimes we are focused on putting everything back into its normal anatomical position we must avoid that temptation 
and aim to restore function as soon as possible. The next important step is radical debris move. This shows the extent of the skin defect from proximal to the elbow till beyond the wrist, involving nearly half of the circumference of the forearm. The musculotendinous units are all clearly demarcated. I always remember what Dr. Sabapati frequently mentions. Debrimo is not removing what is visibly dead. It is leaving behind what is evidently alive. This requires a change in approach and one must ensure that whatever we leave behind will make it. The presence of the most experienced person at the initial assessment and debrimo is one of the most important features, factors determining outcomes. Less experienced surgeons are less radical and this usually leads to poor debrimo and repeated cycles of infection and debrimo, which delay the reconstruction and that leads to poor outcomes. I always debrief under a tunicate. I find that bleeding is a, not a good indicator of muscle viability. I use response of the muscle to squeeze and the ease with which hair comes off on rubbing for assessing skin viability. If you are not around at the first debris more, it is important to loosen the exfix and debris the fracture. And the, this also makes the soft tissue behind the fracture accessible only once the exfix is undone. We always use a negative pressure dressing in between debris mores. So we followed through with our plan. Usually I prefer a stage reconstruction. Doing everything at one go seems attractive, but requires effort and fatigue can set in. Especially for the key parts of the surgery, like tensioning, tendon transfers and the microsurgical work. In addition, one is able to start immediate mobilization after tendon transfers. And so normally after a free flap, we would wait for the free flap to settle. This patient, however, did not want staged reconstruction as they were coming from Malaysia and preferred to limit the number of surgeries. So we did everything at one go on day three. This is the DIUJ fusion with two headless compression screws. I did not formally pre prepare the joint. This was followed by tendon transfers as planned and the flow through ALT flap with the vastus lateralis. We grafted the raw surface of the vastus muscle. These are outcomes at three months showing good elbow flexion and extension with good finger, wrist extension, good thumb, middle and index finger flexion. Overall, he was quite satisfied with the outcome. My next patient is a 26 year old lady with bilateral open fractures of both bones in the upper limb following a road traffic accident. This was initially managed at another hospital and seen by us 10 days after injury with open infected fractures. I will restrict myself to the more severe injuries on the left hand, on the left upper limb. In addition to the infected gap fractures of both bones that were poorly stabilized, she had loss of most extensor and flexor muscles with only an intact ECRL on the extensor side and FDS on the flexor side. She had a loss of segment of the posterior interosseous nerve and segmental thrombosis of the ulnar artery. Luckily, the skin defect was small and looked amenable to linear closure. So once again, we plan with what we want at the end. What I want is a stable forearm with no infection for the bone. This is done best by debrimo till cultures are negative, followed by stable internal fixation. The musculotendinous units are more problematic as we have loss of both extensors and flexors. My aim was to get reasonable finger flexion and extension. And I plan to use the FDS for both FPL and FDP function and then use a free functioning muscle transfer to restore finger extension. So the treatment plan was discussed with the patient. We are hoping to control infection in three to four weeks skin closure followed by fixation of the bones. Then we do therapy to keep the joints supple. And three months later, once the soft tissues have settled for the flexor reconstruction first, followed by the extensor reconstruction. We kept our plan, uh, controlled infection and fixed the fractures at six weeks. The X-fix were repositioned initially. And then once infection was controlled, the skin was closed and the X-fix removed. And the patient managed with a back slap for a short while, while the pin tracts healed. In areas of gap, we usually place bone cement to avoid a dead space that could get infected. Then we plated both bones. This is the appearance just before tendon transfers for finger flexion. You can see good intrinsic function, good FDS function, but no thumb flexion or finger or thumb extension. We use the index finger FDS for thumb flexion and split the middle and ring finger FDS to restore FDP function of the four fingers.
These are outcomes of the flexor transfer at four months. You can see that finger and thumb flexion has improved. However, the FDS excursion is 50 millimeters and cannot match the FDP excursion of 70 millimeters and needs wrist extension to achieve a full grip. She also underwent a free functioning gracilis at four months. The gracilis was powered by the proximal end of the ulna artery and the PIN and used to restore finger and thumb extension. These are outcomes of the gracilis at one year showing reasonable finger extension and flexion. As I mentioned earlier, I prefer stage reconstruction. It is better to do the flexor reconstruction first as that is more important to overall function and valued by the patient. A good analogy for flexor reconstruction is scoring a touchdown in American football. This is what gives you six points. Extensor reconstruction is scoring the field goal after the touchdown. Gives you only one point, but it is a nice feeling. Our last patient for today is a 35 year old man from Nauru, which is a Pacific island, who came two weeks after a road traffic accident with a large open infected wound on the back of the right forearm. Luckily, he had no bone and joint injuries. He only had one functional muscle in this forearm, the FCU. He had no other flexors or extensors. In addition, he had a long segment thrombosis of the radial artery, loss of the posterior interosseous nerve, and a large hemicircumferential skin defect involving the entire dorsum of the forearm. The end result I had in mind was finger flexion and extension, but I only had FCU. Therefore, we planned to do a biceps to FDP transfer using a tensor fascia lata graft, followed by a FFMT for finger extension. As far as the skin defect, although a large ALT was suitable, I wanted to preserve the vessel for a FFMT and we decided to do a large groin flap. This was our treatment plan. Three weeks for infection control followed by flap coverage. This was followed by stage flexor and extensor tendon reconstruction. After control of the infection, we placed a silicon drain as a spacer to allow passage of the fascia lata tendon graft at a later date. We then closed the vola wound. A large abdominal cum groin flap was designed and used to resurface the dorsal defect. And a skin graft was used to resurface the secondary defect. The flap looked good and we maintained passive finger range of motion to keep the silicon rod mobilized as well as maintain the joint supple. We continued a passive range of motion after flap division also. We sent him home for a short while and he continued therapy at home. Five months after the initial presentation, he used a facial lata graft to replace the silicon rod. This video shows the arc of flexion of the fingers before the facial lata graft. And this and this video shows once the facial lateral graft was done, the, the, the range of motion has improved. This is biceps using a facial lateral graft to the FDP of the fingers. Unfortunately, he ran out of money for the extensor reconstruction and never went ahead with the last stage of FFMT for extensor function. In summary, the key steps to a successful reconstruction after a mangling injury are to plan with the end in mind, debris radically, fix stably, and plan staged reconstruction. Thank you.